folks. Hi. Yeah, welcome back to school. It's an exciting Tuesday. Happy Garbage Day. What day? Yeah, okay. So I have to explain this because I now have an avatar on my YouTube channel that is me in a t-shirt that says Happy Garbage Day. So if you see this, you'll have to explain. So first off, hi, I'm Lisa. I will be your host this semester. And in my neighborhood in Coralville, the garbage pickup is on Tuesdays. And this initially became very important during the pandemic when I was in my home every single day with no difference between days. The only difference being that I knew that if it was Tuesday or Thursday, I had to show up in front of my Zoom to teach everybody. But I didn't know which day it was usually. But then it became, well, if it's garbage day, that means it's Tuesday. And at the end of class, I say, see you Thursday. And if it's Thursday and not garbage day, then I see, I'll have a, have a good weekend. I'll see you later. So that's my, that is my opening line on Tuesday is happy garbage day. So that, that's the story behind that. Yes, I am a little weird, in case you couldn't tell. I'm also really excited that somebody got me a big stool to sit in behind this desk because I've been standing here for like four years and now I can sit the hell down, which is my preferred way to do work. I had way too many crappy jobs that involved standing on my feet, so now I relish the opportunity to sit down whenever I possibly can. I did go for a run today, though, so I'm not completely sedentary. I just sit the rest of the time. Anyway, you are in the right place if you are here to learn about generalized linear models. Uh, here is the course website where everything is going to be. And if you're looking at this web page and going, yeah, 1997 called and they'd like your, their web design back, you're not wrong. But I do it this way so that everything is on one page and it can be easily updated. I keep all of my materials out on the web so that anyone can benefit from them regardless of whether they're in this class or not. The exception to your course materials is that the readings are inside ICON. That way I don't have any copyright issues with posting those publicly. So this is where everything is going to be for the semester. We're meeting in here. And obviously the Zoomers have figured out that you can come on Zoom instead if you wish. You don't need my permission. You can choose in a given day how you want to attend class. Um, office hours are going to be on Zoom only as well. This semester I am doing them on Mondays and Wednesdays from 12 to 1.30. And I realize that means that you may end up needing to eat lunch in front of me while you talk to me. Totally fine with that. If you need to bring lunch or snacks during this time of class, totally fine with that too. Just please don't spill anything on the computers and get me in trouble. Fair? I think so. Cheers to that. I highly recommend Diet Do as a teaching tool. It helps to get me through. So I have then lecture zero here as the first thing to talk about, the first of which is some organizational stuff so that I don't ramble too much about what the class is about. So Zoomers can hear me and see me. You're good to go. Rumors, that's all of you. R-O-O-M-E-R-S. See, your rumors versus Zoomers. You can see. You can hear. It's great. So a little bit about what to expect. And then the rest of this is trying to give you a sense of the bigger picture of what this class is about and how it feeds into advanced coursework should you find yourself thinking this stuff is really cool and that you'd like to learn more, which is what to be honest, I'm hoping for. So what to expect? This is not a course about statistics. I don't teach statistics. My PhD is in psychology. I teach data analysis. I teach quantitative methods. So the object here is for you to get better at using data to conduct research and to be able to understand the research that other people conduct using quantitative methods. The more methods you know, the better your research can be. So if the only thing that you ever learned was, say, a t-test about how to compare group mean differences, the only kind of research question you could ever think to ask is about group mean differences. But if you learn more methods, you think through a different type of window, a lens, if you will, and then you can have new questions and new answers. So I'm trying to expand our horizons as to what is possible in the world of social science research. If you don't know me yet, you should know that this is not going to be a scary experience. That is not my goal. If you are interested in doing proofs and theorems and lemmas and all those scary words, 
I direct you to the stats department or the biostats department. That is not our game here. So we're not going to spend time doing hand calculations. You're going to be using software. Very occasionally, I might have you calculate like a difference between two numbers in Excel or something, but that's it. We're not going to compute sums of squares and F ratios and stuff like that by hand, because as it turns out, in this class, that's not even possible. The models that we'll be working with have iterative search algorithms that find the answers that can't really be replicated by hand, even if you wanted to. We're not going to be memorizing or deriving formulas. It's okay to trust the work that other people have done and think that they got it right. We're going to be trusting the computer programmers, but I'm going to be showing you things in a couple different packages so that hopefully we will have converging evidence as to what the best answer should be. The hard part about learning quantitative methods is not the math. It is a language problem. It is a working memory problem. It's trying to be able to link together ideas into ways of expressing those ideas using notation and equations, which yes, it's language, but we have to learn the language to be able to do it, and then to translate those ideas into program syntax and coding languages. It's a language problem. That's what makes this tricky. It's also a logic problem. If my data have this characteristic, what do I do? If they have that characteristic, what do I do instead? So trying to figure out how to map all of these things together is where the complexity lies. It's not about the math. I don't need you to have had much advanced math. I need you to have a lot of language and the capacity to beat your head against the wall until it sticks. That's what we'll do in, an, in a good way. In a good way. I think everyone can do this. Everyone can benefit from this, and everyone is capable. If you weren't capable, you wouldn't be here. That's the truth of the matter. So my focus in teaching quantitative methods is to make them accessible and to focus on mastery. I don't care how long it takes you to get there, so long as you eventually get there. That's why I don't do tests. I don't believe in them. There's never a point in quantitative methods where you're like standing over somebody bleeding and it's like, do you remember the formula for Pearson, Pearson's correlation right now or this patient's going to bleed out? Like, no, that's not a thing. So given that there's never a, a situation in which you have to know something or else, I don't approach my, my classes that way. So everything that you do, you will have multiple chances to do it and get it right. The material that I have is divided into units. I have six units planned. And a unit to me is a combination of a set of lecture slides and then one or more examples. And these are deliberately separate. The lecture is, tends to be what I start with first because it presents what we're doing and why we're doing it that way. Separate from that then is the how. And so I have examples using data and syntax and annotated output that describe what, how you would actually go about implementing these models on data. And the packages that I'm going to be using this semester, Stata and R, to, for the most part, and then a package called M+, which you probably have, may not have heard of. Has anyone used M+, before? A little bit, a couple people. Okay, so good news. All of these packages are freely available on the University of Iowa virtual desktop, and I have submitted a list of IDs to the tech people who control that access to M+, so all of you should have access as well. Um, this course used to use SAS as well, because that's the program that I'm most familiar with. But SAS has sort of fallen out of favor and doesn't get updated as often as the others, which is why I made the decision to not focus on that as much. I sent out a survey um, at the end of last semester and then the beginning of this one about your folks' use of software. And most of you are comfortable in at least one package, Stata or R for the most part. If you're not, that's okay. Everything that I'm going to ask you to do, I will give you an example of what it looks like. And your job will be to take that example, modify the code to make it fit your problem, and run it. So you're not going to have to like ask the Google, how do I do this in R? That's my job. I will have already asked and found one or more answers, and I will give you the answers. So find and replace is going to be your friend when it comes to coding. So everything is take home, open note, and untimed. I do accept late work. 
by the end of the semester, everything needs to be in. However, I recognize that things with actual due dates tend to get done and things with soft due dates tend to get pushed to the bottom of the list. So for my sake and for your sake, I don't want to be pushed to the bottom of the list. So that's why I do have um, penalties, small penalties for late work. Out of 100 possible points in the semester, I take off two points for a late homework. I'll talk about that in just a second. And one point off for what I call a formative assessment. So if you turn in absolutely everything late, you're looking at a B. Like nothing you can't come back from. So just a little bit of incentive to help us stay on track. I promise that homework will never be due any sooner than is currently on the syllabus. It may be pushed later, though. That's because I want to ensure that we have enough time, preferably a week or so after we finish talking about something, to where you'll be responsible to do work on it. So if it takes us longer to go through something than I had planned, okay, homework's going to get pushed back in a couple days to make that um, enough time for you to be able to process everything. If you, I forgot to say this part, if you're looking at the syllabus and you're thinking to yourself, oh, I'm going to be out of town that week, or I have this other big thing that I need to take care of that week, and you'd like an extension, ask me. Send me an email at least two weeks in advance and give me a proposed new due date, and I'll give you one. The first thing I'm going to ask you to do is something called homework zero, which you will do for two points of extra credit. It's designed to make sure that you're able to access the homework system and know how to use it. So that basically translates into one free as homework anyway. So the activities I'm going to have you do to try and facilitate your learning, one type of activity is what I call a formative assessment. It's top of the head kinds of questions, things that you should be able to answer if you've been in class, um, a lot of vocabulary drills, that kind of thing. And you get two points for doing each one. It doesn't matter if you're right. I want you to try. If you give me an honest attempt, I will give you the two points. <clears throat> this is also an opportunity for you to ask me questions about things you want to go over. So this will be in ICON. These will be due on Monday night. I will look at them the next Tuesday morning, and then we'll talk about them as a group in class. The other thing that I'll have you do is homework. And this is going to be data analysis. So the way that the homeworks work, one through four and number six, each of you is going to have a unique data set. The way that it works is that I use your ID number as a random seed. So everyone has their own version of a data set with a common story. And I will ask you to fit models and answer questions about the effects that are being found in the models. And there are two kinds of questions. One is computational. So I'll say, like, you know, what's the slope for this variable? And you type in the number that shows up in your output. If you're right, that number turns green. If you're wrong, it stays red. And you can enter the numbers as many times as it takes until it turns green. So you will know immediately if you're on the right track. And there are questions that I ask specifically to test whether or not you have the right model, the right setup for the model, and the right way of coding predictor variables to tell you what you want to know. So I don't keep track of how many times you try these things, by the way. I don't have access to that information, and I don't need it. If you get it right on the first try, good for you. If it takes 100 tries, maybe not so good, but you'll get there eventually. So you have infinite attempts to get the computational part right. But just being able to make the program spit out numbers and find them is one skill. Being able to make sense of those numbers is a completely different skill and arguably just as important, if not more so. I want you to be able to interpret what you've done. So the other type of question that will be on the homework are fill-in-the-blank results sections. So they will be paragraph completions where you will select from a drop-down menu the right words that describe a given finding. For instance, if you have a slope. You might have to decide if the slope is significantly positive, significantly negative, non-significantly positive, or non-significantly negative. So that way you can practice trying to make the right interpretation within a scaffolded framework. Those do not get graded immediately since they're multiple choice, but you'll get your answers back after you submit it. After the due date has passed, the paragraph completion, the right answers will be green, and if you got it wrong, it will be red followed by what the answer should have been in green. That way you can learn from your mistakes. 
The other purpose that I hope those, those results sections serve is as an example of what a write-up would look like. Like if I'm going to do a logistic regression, what should I include? How should I talk about it? These are meant to be example templates that you can use in your own work. Homework five then is going to be an individual data analysis. Not a project, because I know that word sounds scary, and not a final project, because that's scary to me. It'll be an April project. I would like for you to be able to take data that you care about and do an analysis using one of the techniques that we have covered up to that point. So I'll give you more details about that later. Um, these are individual projects, by the way. I want each of you to do something. Um, if you don't have data available that would work for this purpose, it's fine with me if you make use of public data. There's all kinds of data all over the internet, and I can help you find some if that's something that you need. But ideally, though, this would be an opportunity for you to get started on a conference presentation or a manuscript or something that you're already wanting to do in the context of the rest of your work. That's what I would intend this to be. Double dipping is encouraged. If you have to do a project for another class that might have a qualitative component, for instance, and you want to add a quantitative piece, that would be great. So useful is the main, the main thing here. All right. And because I don't expect you to necessarily get it right on the first try, as long as it's three quarters complete, I will take a first draft. I will give you feedback, and you will get a chance to revise it if you want to get more points, if it doesn't go well. That way you can get some feedback on your writing as well. Okay, how are we doing so far? Okay, so we have a thumb answer system in my classes. Thumbs up is good, thumbs down is bad, and thumbs sideways is yeah. My goal is always at least sideways. But if it's down, then that's, you know, useful prescriptive information. But I look at this and I get a little bit overwhelmed at the amount of work that's, that's sitting out here. So if you're feeling a little bit overwhelmed, it's okay. But there's no midterms, there's no final exams. Everything is do it until you get it right. But you don't have to do it on your own. You have help. So my job is to answer your questions, but I'm not the only one who's going to answer your questions. Come over here. Hi, yeah. Yeah, so you guys say hi to the Zoomers and say hi, hi to the Roomers. Please introduce yourself to the class. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Geraldo, but... My proper name is my middle name, Vladimir. I'm a second year PhD student here in the um, Educational Measurement and Statistics program. And I'm happy to be here so we can work together and see different things and I can help you with everything related to these courses. He had this course last year. So, this, yes. so he's been through it, did well, and is now here to be a TA. When are your office hours? Uh, Mondays and Fridays from 9 and 30. Uh, to 12. On Zoom as well. Yes. Yep. So the way that I think I run my office hours, thank you, and, yes. and presumably the way that you may do yours is I don't take appointments. Basically, if you want to come talk to me, you log in. I answer questions in the order in which people appear, and you can hang out in the background and keep working, and that way if you have like another question, then you can pop back into the queue and I can talk to you. So it's fine with me if you want to just like set aside time to do homework like during office hours just so that you can get help immediately and not get stuck on something. That's totally fine. Um, homework is due on Mondays, which is why my office hours are on Mondays from 12 to 1.30. His are in the morning. Um, his office hours then are on Friday, and I have office hours on Wednesday. So every day of the week you should be able to find us either in class or online. Okay. In terms of asking questions, I'm fine with answering questions via email. Um, if you try to find me in the building, you are not going to have much luck. I will tell you that straight out. I am not in my office very often. I prefer to work at home. But I am on email all day long, so I will tend to respond very quickly. Um, if you send me an inquiry after, say, 8 p.m., you're probably not going to hear back from me for the next day because I don't have much cognition after 8 p.m., and I probably won't get it right if I try to help you then. Um, if you want to talk to me individually rather than come to office hours, you can ask for a Zoom meeting or potentially an in-person meeting if I can accommodate that as well. So you don't have to ask your questions in front of everybody. The chat window 
in Zoom is one of my favorite teaching tools because you can direct message me and ask a question anonymously. So even if you're sitting here in the room, you can log into Zoom so that you can keep track of the chat and talk to me directly if you want to do that. And I have the Zoomers on this window and the screen share here so that I can keep track of everything at once. There is no such thing as a stupid question. I know that sounds like a, in like a trite saying, but it's true. Because if you ask a question that you think is obvious and you feel bad that you don't know it, two things are going to happen. Other people are going to be relieved that you vocalized the question that they had and they didn't have to do it. So you did them a favor. Other people who might actually know the answer are going to be thrilled that they know the answer. You made them feel good about themselves. Win-win. I tend to get on a roll, but you're not interrupting me with questions, okay? Please know that at any point in anything I have to say, I might say, give me three minutes to finish this thought or something like that, but otherwise questions are welcome at any point in time. That's the reason we do a synchronous class, is to have a back and forth. And the questions really help me figure out how to make my material better. So I value your feedback as part of the process, not just like, you should feel bad that you don't know this yet. I should feel bad that I didn't explain it well enough, is the way that I think. So besides doing coursework and answering questions, asking questions, review will be useful. So there's going to be a lot of specific vocabulary that if you just go back over things, that will help it sink in a little bit better. Please don't uh, hesitate to ask for help on homework. So if you've tried like something for 15 minutes straight and you can't get it, stop. Stop and ask for help. No good can come of you trying something for four hours when it could be just like you're missing a, a, a comma, right? That's why it's broken. Or you're missing a semicolon. Like programming can be like those tiny errors that you can't see when you're not used to looking for them can really set things off. Um, the easiest way for me to help you is if you send me a screenshot of the code that you're working on and either the error message that it's being given or like your answer in the homework portal and, and what you think it should be. That way I can figure out exactly where you're going wrong. If you send me your files, that means that I have to go to my computer, like download the files, run the files, and then try to figure out where you are in the process. And that probably isn't as efficient as you like telling me this line, like this is what I need. Readings. There are a lot of readings for this class. And I honestly don't expect you to read all of them. They are for reference purposes. They are to provide additional examples and additional tutorials. The, the textbook that I have, which is available from the library, is very dense. It's state of focused. There's another textbook that is very, um, it's on the technical side. So the readings are meant to sort of balance out a software focus and a technical focus with a more applied focus. The way that I would recommend um, doing readings, though, is let me give the lecture first then do the readings. That way you have at least like a, a loose framework of what you're going to be reading about. And on the syllabus, for instance, the way that I have the readings, like this is for this entire unit, not just for this day. So the first unit is reviewing general linear models for normal outcomes. And these are all the things that I think would be helpful to you in that context. Likewise, the, the unit two is categorical outcomes. These all go with that unit, even though it'll take us several days to get through it. So don't panic when you see a list of like, you know, a thousand pages on a given day. I don't intend for them to have to be read before class. All right, and practice. My hope is that you'll immediately want to start playing with your own data and doing things to it that you didn't know how to do before. And so if you have questions about projects or papers you're reading that relate to the class but aren't necessarily part of the class, please ask them. The more examples I have, the better off we'll all be. It's challenging to teach a course to, two, to, to students who vary as much as you do in your backgrounds. Like I couldn't pick one article that would necessarily apply to everybody. So having different perspectives from your, all of your different uh, programs is going to be helpful. All right, 227. How are we doing so far? I haven't scared anyone away yet. Or at least you're sitting here. You haven't left. So that's good. Zoomers, you still with me? 
I see your thumbs too. Zoom does not have a thumbs down button or a thumbs sideways button, but I've discovered that you could use the poop emoji for thumbs down, I think. Thumbs sideways might be like shrug emoji or something. I'm assuming it has that one, so we'll make it work. Okay, so more about the class then. Attendance is recommended but not required. The bottom line is that I trust you. You're all grown-ups. I trust you to manage your time and your responsibilities, and if you need to miss class, I trust that you'll figure out a way to catch up. I used to be a lot stricter about this, but in the past several semesters, then there had been a number of my students who literally never ever came to class and just watched the recordings and did okay. I don't recommend that, but it is technically possible. So I hope that you come, I hope that you interact, because that will be a chance for you to get your questions answered immediately. If you watch the video and you don't understand something at first, like watching for 40 more minutes when you don't understand the first thing is probably not going to be as useful as like stopping, figuring out whether misunderstanding is, and then continuing. Um, as you can tell, I'm still in a mask. I've been sick for the past couple of weeks, and I hadn't been sick uh, much during the pandemic, and I forget how terrible it is to be sick. It sucks. So I prefer that we all try to keep each other healthy as much as we can. If you may be sick of whatever, COVID, flu, whatever, please don't come. You're not going to miss anything. So I am currently recording. Let me double check as I say that. Yes, I am. Excellent. And I have a YouTube channel. That's where these videos are going to go. So every day on the course website, at the end of class, I will post that day's video and a link to it in the box. So each day's box will have a video or two of whatever we covered. The reason that I do it on YouTube is because it's free and easy. It takes me about five mouse clicks to put up a video. I don't edit them, by the way. Like if you're looking for like a production, you're not going to find it. It is a faithful recording of what happened in class. But after the video has been up for a couple of days, an automatic transcript is added to the video, which means that you can do a search for where I talked about something and it will find the exact spot where that is in the video. Super helpful. The other reason I use YouTube is that if I hosted the videos inside Icon, you don't have access to them after the semester's over. But YouTube lives on forever. So I've been using YouTube since about 2017 to host all of my class materials. You're welcome to make use of any of the videos from this class or any of my other classes as well. Um, I don't have any video on there that's not the screen share. So that I'm, my, my face is not on there. None of the Zoomer spaces is on there. The audio is predominantly what's captured from this microphone. The Zoomer audio is captured. If you're, you don't want your audio on there, you can use the chat window or just talk quietly and then I'll rephrase your question. So trying to keep it as anonymous as possible, but also open. Um, yeah, I already said that. Last but not least, it's January in Iowa. Tornado warnings aside, we can expect some crappy weather for the next couple of months. I have a seven-year-old son whose school shuts down whenever Iowa City schools shut down. So if the schools are closed because of weather, check your email. Odds are good I'm probably going to move to a Zoom-only format so that we don't have to come to campus and hurt ourselves. Um, I will announce any changes by 9 a.m. on class days if we need to move to Zoom. But there were a few times last semester where this presentation thing broke and I couldn't use the room, so we moved to Zoom for those classes until it got repaired. So if I need to change the format, I will let you know. But in the sense that I'm trying to be flexible with you and how you attend class, I hope you can appreciate the need for me to be flexible in how I give the class to you as well. And that keeps me from having to cancel outright. All right, software. So I used to use SAS because that's the, the system that I know the most. And I am phasing it out because no one else wants to use it anymore, which makes me very sad. But the packages that I'm expecting you to choose one of is either to do homework in Stata or R. I will verify that all of the answers can be found accurately either way. So I, I figured this out the hard way last year when I first introduced R, that sometimes the answers don't match and I had to change all the questions where that happened. 
So I can guarantee that you will be able to complete your homework either way. Um, so stata, and yes, I know the proper way to write stata is like this with the lowercase, but stata being case sensitive and not allowing uppercase really frustrates me. So to get back at the man who decided that, I put everything in capital letters when I write out stata. You know, just because I can, right? Take, take, take that. So stata is not free, but it's free to you because it's inside the virtual desktop. I have videos from my, when I taught intermediate statistics, on how to get started with both Stata and R. So if you're new to those packages, um, the course website has links to where those things are. Let me find that real quick. Um, yes. So this class, basically, there are a set of handouts and videos posted on the February 7th date from this class for how to get started using the virtual desktop in all of these programs. So you can make use of that if you're unfamiliar. Um, M plus is structural equation modeling software. The last unit that we have is going to be on path analysis and we're going to be using that. You should all have access to M plus within the virtual desktop as well. Um, if you're used to using R on your own device, that's even better because it runs really slowly on the virtual desktop. Why not SPSS is one question I sometimes get because it doesn't have as much room to grow is the short answer. There's nothing wrong with SPSS for basic things, but it sort of tops out at having the upper level models and all of the flexibility and estimation that those models require. So I don't use SPSS in this class. In theory, it could be used, and I do know how to use it. So if that's something that you really want to be able to learn in addition to either Stata or R, I could probably help you to figure that out. <clears throat> So if you are really good at Stata or R and you know of a way to do something that's faster or more efficient than what I'm doing, please tell me. I will not be offended in the least. I am begrudgingly learning R. That is my status. I know everyone else here loves it and has drank in the Kool-Aid. I'm not that person. R is very frustrating to me. Can I get an amen on that? Anyone else? No, really. I've never touched it. It's scary. It's scary. The reason that I, I do not like R is because of the lack of standardization of the documentation and the syntax. Like every single person's package is written just enough differently that like you can't take one piece of code and port it over and have it work the same way. And trying to figure out which version you're in and what it should be in this particular version and whether it's backwards compatible and all of that stuff drives me a little bit crazy. However, um, I did the hard part last year in adding R to this class, and hopefully now the legwork will be less so. If you're new to R or Stata, do not worry. I'm not going to ask you to do anything I haven't given you an explicit example for, okay? Every example that I give you, you should be able to start from there, modify a few key things, like what's the name of the data, what's the name of the variables, and use that as a template. I'm not expecting you to figure this stuff out by yourselves, okay? And Vladimir is much better at R than I am. So if I can't help you, he certainly can. Stata is much more self-explanatory. The documentation is very consistent. The language is very simple in a good way, like streamlined. There's not a lot of overhead to it. So you'll see that for yourself. So any questions about the software aspect? So, <clears throat> you only have to do one of them. However, if you're going to make the effort to learn these models, it might be nice for you to try both of them. Because every single one of you should have a section on your CV that's something like technical skills, where you list all of the software packages that are sort of research-based, like statistical packages, um, and all the things that you know how to do. So the more packages that you can use, the better your chances of getting an internship or a job or a collaboration opportunity. Because a lot of times, um, investigators, faculty, only know one package. And it's like, well, I can only work in Stata, so if you want to work with me, you have to know Stata. Or I only work in R, and so you have to know R. The more packages you learn, the easier it is to learn more of them because you get used to the process. So this could be an opportunity for you to expand your technical skills in a way you might not have anticipated. 
Um, the reason people love R is that it's free and it can be installed on any type of machine. Stata costs money. If you don't want to use it on the virtual desktop, you can rent a copy of Stata for $48. Virtual desktop, though, can be used um, pretty seamlessly through any device as well. Um, in terms of which to choose, if you're not sure, ask your advisors. Ask the people in your cohort, in your programs, what they tend to use. So Stata, for instance, is very popular in certain disciplines that work with large-scale data sets where they use sampling weights. So this includes sociology, political science, science public health, the EPLS program, our department here, it tends to favor Stata. I like it because it's standardized. If you're planning on taking further EMS courses, I am the only person who does not teach in R exclusively. Every other course is with R, for better or worse. So from that perspective, learning R will help you more to be able to take additional coursework. So yes, I have a link to where you can get started with those videos if you've never used any of these packages before. This is what I expect you to do for your homework. Find the example I gave you, figure out how to modify it. Copy paste and find and replace are your best friends. My syntax is very um, heavily formatted and organized to where that you should be able to like literally go through and be like, find and they change the name of the outcome, changing the name of the data and all that kind of stuff. Um, don't ha hesitate to ask for help. All right, so what are you supposed to know to be here? If you're not sure whether you know enough to be here, let me tell you all what I expect of you. I designed this class from scratch as a follow-up to 6242 or 6243. So if you just finished with intermediate or within the last year or so, you're in the right place. This is exactly where we should be. So I expect that you have familiarity, and this includes using software for these things, basic descriptive statistics and bivariate association, things like correlation, chi-square. Uh, you know what a p-value is, like hypothesis testing as a, as a concept. General linear models. So we will review those in the first unit here just to make sure we're all on the same page, but I'm talking about models where we predict a continuous outcome from either quantitative predictor variables or categorical predictor variables. And some kind of software for doing all of this. One additional piece of complexity that I tend to emphasize more than other people is interaction terms. The idea of testing moderation. Like, does the slope of this variable hold for everybody, or is it stronger for some kinds of people than others? Those kinds of questions. So a lot of what I will focus on in the review unit is how to make use of interaction terms to make sure everybody is on the same page with that. Okay, questions. Are we feeling okay so far? Am I talking too fast? No? That's the first. Normally it's like, yeah. See, this is the problem. I've been teaching since 1230 today and, and sucking caffeine the whole time. So this is the point where it starts to build up in my system and I, I get a little manic. So if I get a little manic, please tell me, can you take it down a notch, Lisa? And yes, you can call me Lisa. I don't have to be Dr. Hoffman or Professor this or whatever. And yes, it, it is spelled L-E-S-A, but it's pronounced Lisa. The story is, when I was born, my mom said that I looked like a Lisa, but not the regular kind. So she named me accordingly. I don't know what a regular Lisa looks like. And I suspect there may have been some pain med medication involved in that creativity of decision making because my mom is normally not that type. But yes, you can just call me Lisa. And you can call him Vladimir. No. Uh, Vladimir or Vladimir? You don't care? Yeah, I don't care. Fair enough. Do you have a story as to why you go by your middle name and not your first name? Yeah, that's weird. Uh, because my, my mom calls me that way and that's the reason. So. There is a story that when, when I was a child in kin kindergarten, my teacher call, called me Geraldo, which is my first name, and I didn't attend <laughs> any of those calls. So <laughs> the teacher called my mom and said, hey, uh, what ha what's, what's happening with him? And she said, oh, yeah, maybe it's because he, he's a person to uh, 
his second name. Hmm? So yeah, Vladi uh, is, is, is the right version in Spanish, but it is better Vladimir or Vladi, any of those is good to me. Okay, so just don't call you Geraldo and you're good. Yeah. Right? Okay, yeah. fair enough. Yeah, so it's the moms, right? Well, my dad goes by his middle name, too. That's the thing. It's like, if anyone calls the house asking for John, it's like, yeah, no, you don't know who this guy is. Anyway. And we'll do the thing where we all say our names probably next time, too. I want to get everybody sort of settled in here first. That way you can uh, hopefully find folks to work together on things and some, uh, some support for each other. All right. So no, any more, any, I'm switching topics here, which is why I'm making a point of this. Any other questions or thoughts about the class format, requirements, like the, all that stuff? Zoomers, so good? Good. Okay, so what is this class about and why is it important? That's what I want to tell you about here. So what are we covering? Generalized is the key word here. The eyes part means models for predicting outcomes that are not normally distributed. That's what eyes means. So general, as a word, actually has a very specific meaning. A general linear model is designed for a particular kind of outcome variable, one that's supposed to be conditionally normal. It's the idea that the E, the residuals that are left over, are normal. So that means it's supposed to be continuous in the first place. But in a lot of uh, research areas, you don't have continuous outcomes. You have something like predicting you know, whether or not a patient is going to recover or not recover. You might be interested in the number of disruptive behaviors a child exhibits in a classroom. You might be interested in predicting whether a student decides to go to college or go to a vocational school or not do anything. Like these are all valid types of outcomes for which general models are not appropriate. Old school perspective, like if you read like textbooks from like the 70s and 80s, they'd be like, well, make it normal. We're gonna transform your data. We're gonna log it or square root it or do something to it, we'll fix it. We're gonna make it normal. Outcomes like that can't be fixed but it turns out that's actually not a problem. It's like having a screwdriver. There's two kinds of screwdrivers that I'm familiar with. Like there's like straight, which is like a two kind, like a screw that only has a line through it, or the one that has four, which I think is Phillips, right? These models are like that. Okay, you look at the screw. Does it need this kind of screwdriver or that one? Okay, if it, this one doesn't work, you get a different kind. Uh, another analogy I can think of is Mr. Potato Head. You familiar with this toy? A Mr. Potato Head is a potato that's a head. And you can stick in eyes and mouths and nose. And if you're feeling crazy, you can stick, you know, the, the nose in where the high eyes go and the eyes in the mouth hole. And it, it's all craziness, right? I, that's what I think of. It's like, okay, what kind of data problem do I have? And what do I need to stick in here to make it work? So the more choices you're aware of, the better job you can do fixing your screw or assembling your Mr. Potato Head. So generalized is a higher order umbrella of which general is a very specific case. And the terminology sucks, I understand that. I didn't make it up though, this is the way the world talks. So beyond normal outcomes, unit two is binary, so two choices, ordinal, or nominal, nominal meaning unordered choices. Unit three is count and what I call if and how much. That is my untechnical term for what other people would call zero inflated outcomes. So like if I surveyed this class and said, how many cigarettes do you smoke in a given week? You're probably gonna have a lot of people who don't ever smoke and they will have a giant pile of zeros for those answers. And there's nothing you could do to make that answer anything other than a zero. Some of you might smoke sometimes or more often, and then you have some sort of distribution beyond that. So an if and how much type of outcome would be something to where, like you're trying to predict, like if someone's a smoker, like that's one thing you might wanna know about a person, and among the smokers, how much do they smoke? 
there's a lot of outcomes that work like that. Um, history of, say, childhood maltreatment. You know, were you abused? Yes or no. If you were abused, what is the level of severity or frequency to it? So counts work like that. Continuous outcomes sometimes work like that, where there's sort of a pile of zeros because you're dealing with two different kinds of people, if and how much. And then there's other kinds of outcomes that you're not really sure what to do with necessarily, but you know that they're not going to be normal. So if you're predicting something like GPA, GPA is bounded at 4.0. Um, if you have outliers, have you heard that term before? Like outliers, people whose data are like so far away from everyone else's that you're like, what the? Like if we had, you know, number of text messages sent in a given month or something. And I looked at the phone record for um, Jonathan's daughter, Daphne. It probably would say something like, you know, 1.6 million text messages were sent last month. Is that an outlier or is that a teenage girl? Six of one, half a dozen of the other. So if you have continuous outcomes where large, large values are possible, and you don't want to throw them away, but you also don't want them to ruin the rest of the model, what can you do about that? Well, it turns out you can fit a, what's called a quantile regression, which is based on predicting the median instead of the mean. The median is much less sensitive to outliers because it's the 50% middle mark, and middle doesn't care how far the, the edges are. So there's all these different approaches that are developed for not normal, where it's not a bad thing, it just it is what it is, and you want to be able to model it as accurately as possible. Multivariate models. There are a lot of situations in which you need to collect more than one outcome for the same person in order to answer a research question. So like if I'm comparing performance under two different conditions, I might have you take a test in a room that has no noise whatsoever, make you listen to Metallica, make you listen to classical music, right? And I might be interested in how your performance changes as a function of your environment. Well, you have a lot better chance at looking at changes if it's the same person measured repeatedly than if it's different people. So that's what's known as a repeated measures type of design. We can do that just fine, but we need to change the model to make it understand that those outcomes from the same person have to have an extra relationship that outcomes from different people don't have. The technical term for that is dependency. You may have heard that phrase before. It means correlation. General linear models assume that everybody's independent, no dependency. So if you have dependency because you've measured somebody repeatedly, we got to build that into the model. Um, anybody here do family relations kind of stuff? Like studying relationship satisfaction or parenting child relationships, any of that kind of stuff? Nobody? Can someone pretend like they do, just so I can keep going? Okay, Vladimir, yeah. you are now a family psychologist. Congratulations. Yes. Yeah. Well, that's another case where, do you think the answers from the parent and the kid have something to do with each other if they're part of the same family? Yeah, probably. So we would want to be able to predict both of them at the same time so that then we can have, like, mom stuff predicts the kid's outcomes and the kid stuff predicts the mom's outcomes and the mom stuff predicts the mom outcomes and the kid stuff predicts the kid outcomes, and then we get into this picture. That picture, by the way, is called an actor-partner interdependence model. But that's the idea, is that you can have outcomes from the same family, predictors from the same family, things measured repeatedly. If you're interested in longitudinal research, that's my bread and butter. That's my thing. I'm teaching advanced longitudinal as the class right before this one, but all of this stuff sets you up to be able to do longitudinal analysis down the road as well. Path analysis. So the idea of testing mediation. Is that a term you've heard before? A little bit? So mediation is the idea that, like, you have this factor that causes some response, and this response causes some other thing to happen, such that the relationship between the first thing and the last thing is gone after you control for the middle thing. Those types of models, so, again, gestures here, See, this is the benefit of coming to class instead of just watching it on YouTube. 
YouTubers don't get this excellent gestures to complete your learning. So if you make the mediation triangle here, this top variable is both an outcome of the first thing and a predictor of the last thing. It has to do two roles at the same time. You can't do that in a standard general linear model. Each variable is either a predictor or an outcome and not both. But you can do that in something called path analysis, which is a multivariate regression framework where you can have all kinds of relationships going on at the same time. If you can learn path analysis, that sets you up very nicely to be able to learn structural equation modeling, which is another class that I teach coming back in fall 24, um, which is relationships among latent variables that are measured by observed outcomes. And that can be done with normal outcomes or not normal outcomes of various kinds. So this is what I hope to get through here in this current class, and it's designed to set you up for future coursework. Okay, any questions on any of that list? All right, so why? Legos. I want to give you a little bit of, of my perspective on how all this stuff fits together. The big picture of Legos, each of them is tiny little blocks. Anyone here have children who play Legos? Those things hurt when you step on them. That's what I can tell you about Legos. You don't need a home security system. You just need Legos all over the floor. No one's going to be able to make it through that alive. So these tiny little innocuous things here, they're kind of amazing because you can build really cool, complicated structures out of these tiny little blocks. That's the way that I view quantitative methods. It's a series of blocks. You acquire the blocks, you figure out how to stick them together, and then you can make anything that you want to. So what are the four Legos that all of quantitative methods can be described by? That's what I want to tell you about. Where this came from is when I first started, so I've had several different faculty jobs. Um, my PhD was in psychology, quantitative and cognitive. The first place that I worked was the University of Nebraska. And the reason that I was hired there was to teach advanced coursework in quantitative methods. They had nothing past regression. So I showed up to teach longitudinal modeling and structural equation modeling, and I realized real quick that there was just a giant canyon between the classes I was trying to teach and where the students had left off. There was way too many things at the same time. So over a series of years, we tried to figure out how to make fewer things new and introduce them in other contexts so that the path would not be quite as abrupt to get over there. So I want you to be able to be conversant in traditional methods because there are a number of people who are going to still talk about results from my ANOVA, results from my multiple linear regression, and I want you to know what those words mean. But at the same time, I want you to be able to recognize the Legos involved in those sentences. ANOVA, analysis of variance, for instance. You learned this before, yes? Maybe you're not sure if you have. Have you ever fit a regression model where the predictors are dummy-coded variables of zeros and ones? That's ANOVA. So if you recognize ANOVA as categorical predictors with a continuous outcome, then those are the blocks that you can then stack things on top of. So once you understand the pieces, then you're able to combine them in new and cool ways. So this first instance, we called it the bridge course. It was literally what my husband and I, so Jonathan Templin, another faculty member in our department, we built a course together that was designed to bridge between the regression course and the advanced courses, and that's what this one became. So of the four Legos, we're going to hit three of them in this course. One is linear models. The second is different methods of estimation. Third is link functions for predicting different types of outcomes. And if we get those three, then the next layer of Legos that you'll be able to stack on top of it is number four, which I have two different names for, but they're actually the same, either random effects or latent variables, as, in, as the fourth type of construct that you need. So this is used for modeling correlation or dependency in longitudinal or clustered data. So if you're interested, say, in studying student outcomes, but the students are nested in classes and classes are nested in schools, that's what those kinds of models are for. 
If you're interested in measurement and how to optimally characterize someone's true ability given how they answered a bunch of questions, that's the world of factor analysis, item response modeling, and structural equation modeling. So they, they're very different worlds in terms of what they're for, but the underlying commonality is this block number four. So my hope is that by taking the first three blocks and making sure you understand them here, you'll be able to pick up coursework with the fourth one, and only that fourth part will be new, as opposed to literally everything being new at the same time. So what do I mean by this? Linear models. The idea of what is the relationship between two variables? Is this relationship still there after you control for some other thing? Is the relationship the same for all people, or does it, is it based on other people's characteristics? Being able to answer those kinds of questions by figuring out how to code predictor variables, how to put them together in combination, and how to get all of the relationships you'd be interested in. That's a linear model skill. You've already started on that journey, and I'm here to continue taking you forward with that. So all statistical models can be viewed as some kind of linear model, even the ones like ANOVA where you're focusing on group mean differences. And so I'm going to teach them from that perspective of what is the underlying model. General linear model is where you're starting. So what's confusing about a lot of the historical ways that people describe models is they get different names for different flavors of the same thing. So if you have a continuous outcome and you put in one, I'll say it continuous or quantitative, those are synonyms to me, predictor. People call that simple linear regression. If you have two predictors, that's multiple linear regression. It makes it sound like something different as opposed to the same model with an extra piece to it. What if you have two groups and you want to know if they differ on a quantitative outcome? Oh, well, that's a t-test. What do you mean? Every single piece of output has a T in it somewhere. What if I have three groups? Oh, that's not a T test anymore. That's analysis of variance. Wait, I thought I was looking at mean differences. Why is it called analysis of variance and not analysis of means? I don't know, because AMOMA doesn't have the same ring to it, I guess. See, that's a joke. AMOMA? Mm -hmm. Yeah. There's an interstate, um, Interstate 80 on the way here. There is a stop that's like, Avoca or something, and every time I see that sign, I read it as ANOVA, like every, every single time. But, so it's like all these different words for, wait a minute, what's the difference between these models? Well, this predictor has numbers, and this predictor has kinds, and we need different words for that? No, we don't. What if we have two different types of categorical predictors? Oh, well, that's a two-way ANOVA with interaction terms. What if I have some of each? Well, then I need another word of two-way and COVA. And it's just regression. It's all the same thing. The reason that these are all the same thing is because of the outcome variable. All of these have in common one concept of an outcome. So let me get you a little bit of notation to get with these ideas. Here's an example equation that would describe a general linear model. The first line here. Subscripts matter, folks. I am a subscript enthusiast. I didn't used to be, but I came around because they clarify for everything in the model, whether it's a constant or a variable. And if it's a variable, what does it vary over? So start with why. I always use why for outcome variables, things to be predicted. Synonyms include criterion variables or dependent variables. They're why. Y has a sub I. Can you guess why that little I is there? For each observation. Say it again? For each observation. Yeah, because each person gets their own. Each I for individual has a different Y. In other words, Y is a variable, not a constant. The first thing that goes into Y is beta zero. What's that thing? Intercept. It's an intercept. More specifically, though, it is a fixed intercept. This is a distinction that I introduce right away that other people do not. Beta 0 is a fixed intercept. Beta 1, beta 2, and beta whatever are fixed slopes. The word fixed 
means it's a constant. So beta zero doesn't have an I. Do you know why? Everybody gets the same one. Everybody gets the same intercept as the starting point for their score. Beta zero is your expected outcome when everything else zeroes out, which is when these predictor variables are zero. So everybody starts with a beta zero at the meantime, at, a, at the beginning. Beta one, that's a slope. What's a slope? Think to yourselves, I know this. What's a slope? It's, a, it's an effect of a predictor. I'll start you off on a sentence. Like if the slope is 2, what would that mean? If this slope right here is 2, what would that tell me? Rate of change. I like that one. So I would say something like y goes up by 2. Yeah, as x increases by 1. It's change in y for a 1 unit change in x. And I tend to use the word difference instead of change because these are different people and they're not changing into each other. I tend to reserve the word change for longitudinal data in which you are literally changing over time, but that's a semantic distinction to most people. So yeah, change in y for a one unit change in x or, or, or difference in y for a one unit difference in x. Beta one is also a constant. Beta two goes this one and then for whatever the last one is here. What's E? An error term, it might be an R in other people's notation. I like E for error. I call it residual usually. It's the leftover part. It's the part that, well, why didn't you get this exactly right? Well, I don't know, because we didn't control for every possible reason why somebody has a different outcome than somebody else. This is everything else that you don't know. So the terms of whether this is a t-test or an ANOVA or a regression, boil down to what kind of variable these x's are. If x is a 0, 1 variable, then that's your, your t-test. If we have three groups, so that we need two different 0, 1 variables to distinguish the three groups, that's an ANOVA. If these things are quantitative variables where they're, they're amounts of something, that's regression. But it's all one model. The only difference is in what kind of predictor you have in here. And after you leave this world of general linear models, those naming conventions go away. The models in this class are named for what kind of outcome they predict. They are agnostic as to what kind of X predictor variables you got on the right-hand side. You can stick in whatever you want. This notation, Y hat, this little carrot thingy here, that's the idea of the model predicted outcome without the residual. So anybody who has the same x values has the same y hat. So the term general linear model is the model we chose for E, actually. That's the part that matters. What are we assuming is true about E for this to be valid? <clears throat> well, the way that it's written, if you read stats textbooks, is something like this. We're saying y is conditionally normal with the predicted value of whatever the model says it should be from y hat. And this thing over here, variance, the variance of the e's. So the conditional mean is y hat and the variance is this. So we assume a bunch of stuff, though, about this to make this work. E's are independent. When might that not be true? Ideas? Um, I was just going to say, like, if, it's, if you're tracking somebody's change over time. Yeah. If you got a bunch of E's from the same person, they're probably going to be related. What if the E's come from two kids in the same classroom? Probably. Especially if it's an academic outcome that the teacher is supposed to be, you know, helping them to acquire. So if that isn't true, we need a new model. In, the, in this class, we're sticking with independent up until the last unit, where we get into multivariate models for multiple outcomes at the same time. The normal part, that may not be true. If you have an outcome that is binary, 
a zero or one outcome. There is no possible way that E's can be normal. It cannot happen. So we need something else. The other one is a little bit trickier because it's less obvious, but it's just as important. The idea that this is one number right here. The residual variance is one number. That means it applies equally to everybody. Another way of saying it is that the model predicts equally well, regardless of where you are on your outcome and regardless of what your predictors are. So here's a picture that goes with this idea of, and yes, I'm not making this shit up, this is what people call it, homoscedasticity, otherwise known as constant variance or homogeneity of variance. So here's my regression line in this picture, which I stole from these people. And around the regression line, the expected value is the line, and then there's some expected E's around it. These models say that the same spread of the E's happens the whole way through. So the model predicts equally well along all of X. That's what we're assuming. In contrast, it could look something like this. In this picture down here, which is helpfully labeled not good as opposed to good, we have this fan shape where the E's spread themselves out the further up on Y or X you go. This type of variance pattern is really common for count outcomes as an example. Because if you don't do something, if you have a count of zero or one, there's not as much room to be wrong about that than if you're trying to predict a count of 100, but it could be 150 instead. So the E variance, if it spreads itself out like this, this is a violation. Does anyone know that it's called, if it's not homoscedasticity? Heteroscedasticity, not constant variance. Well, this is another choice. We don't have to choose this. If you have a model that looks like this, then we can say, no, I want the E's to have bigger variance as Y goes up or as X goes up. So a lot of the generalized models, in addition to saying E doesn't have to be normal, they also say E's variance can change as a function of the predicted outcome. It's not constant on purpose because that's the way it works in that type of outcome sample. So any of these, if any of these things is wrong, if they're not normal, if they're not independent, and if the variance isn't constant, this type of model is going to be wrong to some extent, and we need something else. So the something else is where we're headed. All right. So that will be a nice cliffhanger, I think, to leave you until Thursday. The concepts that you learned about linear models hold in this class and in every single class you could take past that. A slope is always a slope. An intercept is always an intercept. There's always some kind of variability left over because your model's not perfect. Like those core concepts will stay with you. How to set up your model to make sure that the relationships between your predictors and outcomes are captured in the way that you want is a skill. And you've started learning that skill in your previous coursework, but this class will really help you practice that because I've got a lot of complex linear models that I'll give you a chance to estimate. So then we'll get to the rest of this later. Questions before we call it a day. I see a lot of this. It's like, I might have a question, but I don't want to ask it in front of everybody at 3.11. That's fair. You can ask it later to me in email or on Thursday. All right, then I will say thanks for being here. Happy Garbage Day. And I will see you all on Thursday, I hope. Bye for now. Bye, Zoomers. <laughs> <laughs>